Fantastic. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This is classifying bot IP addresses in Phoenix. So a bit of an introduction. My name's Michael. I'm the founder at Praxial.io. As Eric said, it's bot detection for Elixir applications. So if you've used ReCapture or Cloudflare, the functionality is similar, blocking malicious bots. And if you're watching this talk, please feel free to send me an email with questions, feedback. If you're watching this, I very much would like to hear from you. So today I want to start with a story where we have a website called Black Cat Concert Tickets. And as you can imagine, it sells concert tickets. People log in, create an account, and they purchase tickets to an event. And we have a software engineer working there named Kat. And she's responsible for this application written in Elixir and Phoenix. And one day she runs into a problem where bots are purchasing concert tickets before people can. And this is a pretty common problem where the, re like the reason someone would do this is to purchase all of the tickets before real people can and then resell them at a higher profit. Uh, sometimes termed scalping. Many places frown upon this here in America. There's laws against it and Kat doesn't like it as well. So she decides to investigate and wants to fix it. So this is a diagram of what's happening. There are these bots and they're all coming from the IP addresses of rented cloud servers. So if you're the bad guy here, you're renting a cloud server or using the free tier or something, putting your code, which could be a Python script or some Selenium puppeteer thing, and you're going to Black Cat concert tickets, monitoring it, and then buying all the tickets before the people can. And that is horrible. So Kat comes up with a solution. She wants to write a plug that will stop these cloud servers from buying concert tickets. And this is a simplified example, real world bot detection. If you have experience with it, it's a very complicated thing. But the reason that I'm doing this simplified example is because I want to demonstrate problem solving in Elixir. So there's two problems Kat needs to approach here. The first is how do you quickly determine if an IP address in the incoming connection in your Phoenix con matches a cloud provider? Like we have a list of all the IP address or the IP prefixes for a cloud provider, but we have to quickly determine if the incoming IP matches. That's problem one. The second problem, once that's solved, is this data structure you come up with. It's going to be pretty big, about 28 megabytes. And you need a way to access this from all your different processes because every incoming connection to your Phoenix application has to access this without blowing up your memory. So. Maybe you're familiar with ETS or gen server or persistent term. I'm going to compare these for you and, and show you which one Kat picked for this problem. So to begin, let's start with problem number one, the fast matching on IP prefixes. So Kat knows all of the IP prefixes, like the public IP range for this cloud provider. They're published in what's called sitter notation. So I have an example here for IPv4. 35140, you can see the slash 22. And then there's an IPv6. That's the one that starts with 2600. Cat has a million of these prefixes. The request comes into Phoenix. She wants to compare it against all of these cloud IP ranges. And a slow implementation will hurt the user experience because you're waiting around for the match to finish. So performance is something we really care about here. So you can pause for a second here. Think about how you would approach this problem in real life if you had this at work. Just kind of think about it. I want this to be more of like an interactive, like how, how would you approach this if you were doing it? So if you're clever, you probably didn't come up with this, which is bad idea one, where you want to expand all of the prefixes into the individual IP addresses in a list or a map or a set, something like that. Because with IPv4, this slash 22, this represents about 1,000 prefixes, 1,000 IP addresses. So maybe you're thinking, this isn't too many. Problem is IPv6. This is some you know, well over a billion IP addresses. You're not going to be able to represent this in memory. But think about like information encoding, just in an Elixir application, for example. If you want to encode all of the integers from one to a million, you don't create a list with literally the integers one to a million. 
you know, you can just represent that as a list starting at one and going to a million and then doing your integer comparisons. So that saves you memory. And the idea behind IP prefixes is pretty similar. This IPv4 prefix, all of the information is in that prefix. So you can determine if an IP address matches that range just using that sitter notation string. Naturally, you wouldn't want to use a literal string in Elixir. You'd want to find some way to represent it in a consistent way for your comparisons. So this is the PFX library. I linked the author on the slide there. But you can see when you do pfx.new on a string that's a sitter notation, this is for IPv4, you get a struct where the bits are a bit string in Elixir. And then IPv4, the maximum length is 32 bits. So that's where that information comes from. Similar story with IPv6, just an increased max length to 128. So now you have a way to represent the prefix, and maybe you could put all of these in a list or something, and then you iterate through, you have you know, IP prefix, you have your remote IP. If you're not very familiar with Phoenix, con.remoteIP, just the remote IP of the incoming connection, that's what we're looking to match on, but you do con remote IP, con remote IP, and this is not what you want. Your growth is going to be O of N because in Elixir, a list is linear. If you want to determine if something matches in a list, you have to iterate through every single element in the list. But just presenting this information in this way, maybe you're thinking, okay, this is like an unsorted list of IP prefixes. What if we put this in a tuple or something and sorted it so then you could start in the middle and then compare? And if you're thinking in that way, that's very good because you're kind of hinting at the answer here. So I want to introduce the data structure called the Rodex try. It's very good for problems like this. And I want to just start with an example. So imagine we have to store these decimals in some data structure, but you can see here that they're represented in binary. So decimal eight in binary, that's one, zero, zero, zero. We want to determine if eight is in this try. We start at the leftmost bit, which is bit one in this case, go right, and you can immediately see that we would get a match. This avoids the problem of that list implementation where we'd have to iterate through every single thing and get the linear growth. With this, the number of steps you have to take to determine if there's a match is significantly reduced. And this has major performance implications. So in Elixir, this is the IP try library by the same author as PFX. And it shows how you would represent IP addresses in a Rodex try. So here, look at um, IP address 128. If you did a bit representation of that, it's 32 bits long. The first bit would be one. Similar story to what you saw previously, First bit, leftmost bit, that's one, it's in there. So you don't have to go through, you know, if this was a million long, you don't have to do a million checks. You just immediately get it, which is really fantastic. And you don't have to call it to a NIF or anything. This is all native Elixir code. So iptry.new, list of prefixes. They just take uh, like tuples with key value. So don't worry about that. And you can see there would actually be two tries in this case. The 32 key you see in the map, that's for IPv4, IPv6, you know, guess what it's going to be, 128. And then that's how you navigate through the data structure. So maybe you're a bit skeptical and you're thinking, okay, yes, we know about the performance things, but how much faster is this implementation? So let's start with the Rodex try versus the list I showed you. Just to be clear, the list is the wrong way to solve this problem, but if you take the two and implement it with 10,000 fake prefixes, it's about 5,000 times slower on each operation. So you can see the, the try lookup, you could really measure in microseconds, but then the list lookup is measured in milliseconds. If you increase it to 100,000 prefixes, it's now about 48,000 times as slow. You can see now it's up to 33 MS and a million prefixes, it's now a noticeable lag compared to the try lookup where it's barely increased at all and you're still in the millions. So that's, that's why you would think the problem through in this way. So I actually wanna pause here. Um, I'll read chat and stuff just 
since we got that part out, and then we're going to move on to how do you access this thing? Yeah, sure, we can do that. Uh, let's see in the chat. Let us your mm -hmm. questions. Remember, there's also a Q and A um, section on your left side of the screen. Nice. So you can leave all your questions there. Yeah, I see. Try someone did the heart emoji. I don't see any questions, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna continue. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you. So now we have our million prefixes. We're in this big data structure, 28 megabytes, but it's a high traffic site. There's a lot of people that are going to want to do reads from this and, and buy their concert tickets. So now we have this problem where there's many Elixir processes needing to access the try. So how do you store this thing? The first tool people may reach for is a gen server where you store the try, you have your lookup there, a message comes in, Hey, is IP zero going to match this try? Message gets received, replies with the true. The problem is there's a cost associated with that, getting the message in, processing it and putting it out. You've now introduced a bottleneck in your entire system where all of these different people are connecting or bots are connecting to your application and the performance is gonna be shot. This example is so common, it's in the Elixir getting started guide where ETS gets introduced, where if you introduce this gen server in your application where every single request or a high volume of requests is going through, it's gonna degrade the system. So naturally, since this is in the ETS getting started guide, your next tool that you reach for may be ETS. So it's worth noting that ETS does not have a native data type for the Rodex try, it's a set or ordered set. So in this case, what I'm showing you here is if you took the entire try and had a key value where the key was like, you know, try and as an atom, then the value is the 28 megabytes. And then you've all these different processes accessing it. There's gonna be a 28 megabyte memory copy to each calling process. As soon as it's above, you know, five or 10, in this case, there could be hundreds of people accessing it. You're gonna blow up your system memory extremely quickly. So let's pause for a moment and just reconsider what problem Kat's dealing with here. She's got a big 28 megabyte data structure, the Rodex try. There's many processes that need to access it quickly and it doesn't change really. Once all of these IP prefixes are aggregated into the try, there's no need to update or delete them. So that's what we're dealing with. There is something in Erlang that is perfect for what we're doing here called persistent term. It is highly optimized for reading at the expense of writing or updating terms. There's a warning label in the Erlang documentation, which is kind of cool, saying make sure you understand what you're doing before you use this thing. But it's exactly what we want, where we're not updating this. If we were, that triggers this global garbage collection in persistent term. Since it's just reading, it's perfect for this problem. So I wanna show you an example. I did the Rodex try and put 28 megabytes and then we have 20 processes accessing it. And you can see there's a memory spike up to 3000 megabytes. So this would not you know, work in a real application. Compare that to persistent term. It's not 3000 anymore, it's 300. And the reason for that spike up to 300 is because of the generation of fake data once the IP try was generated and put into persistent term, there was absolutely no memory variance once that happened, it was just stable. So you could have thousands of processes accessing this and your memory usage isn't gonna peak at all, which is exactly what you want. So this is our new implementation. We have the 1 million IP prefixes, IP try and persistent term. Bots that are coming from cloud IP addresses will get blocked in the route for purchasing concert tickets. And another benefit of this is, let's say you had a login page for your application and most Phoenix apps do. If you get a login request from an IP address that belongs to a cloud server, there is a 99% chance that's malicious and not a real user. Of course, you know, bot detection is more complicated than that. IP addresses are still a nice thing to analyze though, because it's not something that can be spoofed. A lot of what the client sends to the server can be modified. People modify headers, they modify their TLS signature, but IP address, it has, it can't be spoofed at all. So 
Now people can buy concert tickets and they're very happy. So some conclusions are when you're faced with a problem like this, make sure you look at the data structure that you're using and see if it fits. Gen server in your application can become a bottleneck. Watch out for that. With ETS, it's going to copy non-binary format data to the calling process. So if you get a memory use spike, watch out for that. And finally, persistent term is an ideal use case for data that needs to be accessed by many processes, as long as it's not going to be frequently updated or deleted. For this problem, I also wanted to mention this mailing list post that I saw in the Erlang mailing list, where it mentions that there's an ordered set in ETS. So it may be possible to represent the sitter IP prefixes and then put them in the ordered set and then structure it in a way where you would actually be able to get the update and delete. So this could be a little bit better than persistent term if your problem required it. I didn't see like an implementation of this in Elixir, but if you know of one, um, please feel free to email me. I'm, I'm very interested in the subject. So that's the conclusion of my talk. It's based on a blog post that's up on the Praxial IO blog. So feel free to read it if you want to run the code. I learned better that way personally. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I appreciate